Okay, chapter two, the physical layer and networking concepts. Um, we already kind of went over this like on a general level, we'll get a little bit more in depth. Uh, the first part of it actually just talks about like the different types of networking topologies. Um, I'll go over each of these like a, in a little bit more detail, but the bus topology, ring topology, star topology, and the mesh topology. Um, so the bus topology is basically where all of the individual nodes are connected on a single medium. Um, it's very cheap, but uh, it, does have, it doesn't have any capability for redundancy. If this medium is broken at any point, you're going to lose connectivity to half the network, that kind of thing. Yeah, there's not, I mean, we'll, we'll actually get to what most people end up using now. A lot of these are kind of outdated, um, bus topology being one of them. There, there's not a lot of uh, chances you're going to see this like in a networking environment. Um, ring topology. If any of you guys are old enough to remember token ring, uh, it is ooh, just terrible. Just terrible. Uh, it kind of has the same kind of problem as uh, the bus topology. You break this anywhere, the circle's broken, and it, it doesn't work as it should. The, the way the ring topology works, token ring specifically, which used to be covered heavily in the... Um, the CCNA. I think they actually have a little bit of stuff on token ring. You don't really need to know a whole lot about it, except like kind of what it is. You're never going to have to do anything with it, configure it, that kind of deal, because it's the only time I ever messed with token ring was pulling the cable out of a school so that they could put in Ethernet. Uh, but the way token ring worked was you would have this little virtual token that would um, pass between. Um, Pass between PCs, so you know this person would get a ch you know tokens here. This computer would get a chance to talk and send data out. Data goes out. Token gets passed to the next person. They get to talk. You know, so on and so forth. Um, this actually prevented the problem we were talking about. Uh, CSC, CSMA CD uh, carrier sense multi-access collision detection that you've got a, a problem with on the layer two. That's how token ring prevented that problem. Is since only one computer is allowed to talk at one time you don't have to worry about uh, data colliding because two PCs are trying to, to talk at the same time, but pretty outdated. Uh, you, I really doubt you'll ever see this in your career unless it's like the removal of token ring. Um, star topology. This is actually um, very popular. This is where you've got you know a centralized switch or router, uh, sometimes even a hub if they even make those, uh, where all the individual PCs will, will connect to that. Um, I guess in a way, like it, it lacks some redundancy. You know, if that switch goes down, all these individual PCs uh, go down. But usually, you know, you'd have this connected to some kind of router, and then if it's a regular switch dies, you just throw in another one. You don't lose the whole network because you'd have a an array of these switches connecting groups of PCs. But that's the star topology. You know, it looks kind of like a star, I guess. Mesh topology. This is uh, mesh topology is. Um, where, well, with a full mesh topology, you have a connection from every node to every other node. And as you guys can see from, from this diagram, that becomes extremely expensive to implement after a very uh, small number of nodes are added. Like even with just uh, these six here, I, I can't even count how many connections that they've got going between them. Um, and then, yeah, you've, got a, you've also got like the partial mesh where you, you know, it kind of explains itself. Uh, I mean, it's like the full mesh, but you don't have a complete connection to every single thing. But you do have like multiple connections to multiple things. This guy's only got one connection, that kind of thing. Um, this is is very um, very resilient. You know, you can lose all kinds of connections in here, uh, all kinds of PCs, and the network will pretty much remain intact. The problem with it is obviously it is extremely difficult <laughs> and expensive to implement. So that's why it's. Uh, beyond like a very small network, probably not implemented these days. Um, cabling, <coughs> cabling standards. Uh, so a couple of uh, terms you guys need to get familiar with if you're not familiar with already. Bandwidth is the amount of data that can traverse a medium, uh, generally measured in bits per second, BPS. Um, don't confuse bits with bytes. Eight, you know, eight bits go to a byte, so this is bits per second. That's why you, you know, in, in the networking world, the, we measure everything in BPS rather than bytes. So, you know, you, it's a it's a much smaller standard. Um, attenuation is signal loss that occurs over distances. So, um, you know, again, with guys in the knock working on DSL, if we see attenuations on DSL like above 60 dB, 
usually it's it's going to have some problems. Um, electromagnetic interference EMI. Um, this is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, electrical devices outside of what you're working with that have signals going across the line that are interfering with what you're you're working with. It can be internal uh, or external. Um, and then crosstalk, which is actually kind of somewhat similar to EMI in a way, is interference from an adjacent communication circuit. So like if you've got um, a set of phone cables that are all uh, cabled together, especially like if they're not um, if they're not twisted pair, that's actually the reason they do the twisting of the pairs is to prevent crosstalk. The, it'll just kind of leak into each other. So you've got uh, two subcategories for crosstalk. Near-end crosstalk, which is crosstalk measured from the transmitting end, and then far end crosstalk, crosstalk measured from the receiving end. So think of it as you know, crosstalk measured from the CO being you know far end, and then uh, crosstalk measured from the actual phone in your hand being being near end crosstalk. Uh, cable the cable types, you've got your your coaxial cable, um, thin and thick net available. Um, the coaxial cable actually covers not only like you know cable television, coax cable, um, but uh, certain fiber cables are um, coaxial as well. The coaxial is like, if you actually look at the, the cut of the cable, you've got a, a strand of medium um, with a, a separator, an insulator in between, like another piece of cable. And then twisted pair cable, um, and we'll go into the individuals on those. You know, you got your straight through cable where all the pins connect to the same pin on the other side, your crossover cable, and your rollover cable. And then going actually a little bit more in depth on that uh, on twisted pair cable your straight through cable is going to be your standard like patch cable you know from a, a router to a PC that kind of thing and this actually shows you like what the the pinout is and it's you know one to one two to two three to three four to four five to five you know that you look at each end of it the color coding is the same and on the the crossover cable um, Crossover cables, like let's say you had to connect a, a switch to a switch, you would need a crossover cable. Um, and it, it doesn't cross over on everything, but this kind of shows you a little bit of the pinout. You've got, you know, pin one going to pin three, pin two going to pin six, and so on and so forth. Um, here's another little diagram kind of shows you which one. Some of them are actually straight through, you know, four is connected to four, five is connected to five, but on uh, pins or cables one, two, three, and six, you're going to have some kind of crossover. And then a rollover cable um, is basically where you just completely swap the ends. So, you know, pin one goes to pin eight on the other end. Pin two on one end goes to pin seven on the other end, so, you know, and so on and so forth. Rollover cables are actually what's used inside of uh, the Cisco console cables. Uh, Cisco console cables will come in one of two flavors. One is you'll have a, an RJ45 on one end and a DB9 on the other. The other uh, type of Cisco console cable will look exactly like this, where you've got you know two uh, RJ45 connectors, and this is exactly what's happening on the inside of it. Same thing's happening on the inside of it for the, the DB9 connector type. Uh, it just It's not as obvious because you have to connect to a DB9 thing at the end. Uh, fiber optic cable, uh, you got two flavors of this, uh, multi-mode and single mode. I don't really remember having, if I had questions on fiber optic cable on the test, they were very minimal, like maybe one, possibly two. Um, multi-mode is used for shorter distances, ideal for a campus size network, um, a large diameter, larger diameter than uh, SM fiber. Um, and when, when you when they say campus size network or a campus network, they don't literally mean like it's got to be a school campus. Although like a school campus is like a, a perfect example of a campus network. You know, when you, you guys go out past like Parmer and you see like the large Samsung and Dell facilities and stuff like that, the networks there are going to be considered like a campus sized uh, network uh, where you've got multiple buildings for this larger network. Uh, single mode SM uh, used to span longer distances. Uh, it's got a higher data rate and transmission speed than multi-mode fiber. And then on wireless, um, so you've got uh, wireless fidelity Wi-Fi. You've got 802.11, ABG, and N. At the time uh, the book was written that we're, we're working out of, N was not a fully standardized version yet. So I know there were a few questions on wireless, but they, they didn't really tell you the specifications on N. On the, the latest version of the book, they may have um, clarified that, and there's always a chance. Cisco's always changing their questions, so there's always a chance you could get a question that relates to 
you know, 802.11 in. Um, there's actually some, chater, some chapters way later in the book where we'll go a lot further in depth on these different flavors of wireless and, you know, what bands they use and how they're different and why, you know, one's better than the other, that kind of thing. But right now we're just kind of general synopsis. These are their, the bands. Yeah, I, I think... I don't think Cisco has it. I think they do now, because um, it's they. You had a bunch of um, companies that were just kind of using what they thought the standard was probably going to be. So they were making these devices before, like, in was actually a fully solid. You know, I think it's IEEE approved uh, uh, protocol. Cisco, Cisco has a tendency to update their questions mm -hmm. even if they haven't updated their books yet. So you should probably, uh, we'll get a lot more into this when we get to the wireless chapter, but you should probably have an idea of um, how 802.11n works compared to the other ones once we get to that point, just because there's, there's always a chance they could throw a you know, wrench into things and ask you a question on right. it. Right, do know that Linksys used to, Linksys used to use 802.11n because I've gotten a couple routers from them that are 802.11n, mm -hmm. and Cisco bought them out, so. Yeah, Linksys is just a, like a dummy company for Cisco now, kind of a lower level router. Uh, and then on on uh, top of the you know Wi-Fi standard wireless, you've also got you know, infrared and Bluetooth, which are you know shorter distances, and those are actually covered a little bit more in depth on, on the wireless chapter. <coughs> don't expect a single question on infrared or Bluetooth on the exam. I know I didn't have one. I, I don't expect either any of you guys will. Um, okay, physical layer devices. We already kind of talked about this a little bit. Uh, repeaters kind of says what it is. It takes a piece of data and repeats it at a stronger level. So if you've got a, you know, for you guys in the knock again, um, IDSL, uh, you guys should know already that IDSL is, well, it's terrible, but it always has repeaters on the line um, because it's it's going a further distance than what it was, the technology was really made for. So most of the time on IDSL, you've got a couple repeaters where it, uh, it gets the data to that point and it has to send it out so it can make it to the next, uh, the next hop to make it the full distance to the customer's equipment on the far end. Um, hubs, we, uh, we talked about a little bit as well. It's, it's kind of like a switch, but it doesn't break up a collision domain. So it's, it's just kind of a, an area where anything you connect there, it's all, all the data is going in at once and you've got a chance for uh, data to collide. And then uh, network interfaces, NIC cards, I think. Yeah, that's just a synopsis on that stuff. I think all of these, uh, in, maybe in the next chapter or definitely after that, you'll get a little bit more in-depth on that. So that's it for the first two chapters, and we've gone about an hour. I think that's probably about as much as most people can usually take. They usually, like college classes, they, they put them at 45 minutes to an hour for a reason because after you get to a certain point, you're not paying attention, you're not retaining information anyway, so I'm stopping there. Um does anybody have any questions about that chapter? Really, anything else we covered before we wrap up today? All right, beat it. Uh, once again, the sky will be on my desk. You're not going to go over the Hadron Collider and how it works? No.